Good evening, everybody. This is Darius Asemi, your host uh, of Unfiltered, a GVYR podcast coming to you live from Fresno, California. Uh, tonight uh, on the show, we have David Tangipa, who's uh, running for state assembly. He's going to tell us his perspective, what he thinks about regulation, uh, state, of, uh, state of California, the legislator, the assembly, why he's doing it and what difference he hopes to make uh, representing uh, the northern part of uh, Fresno County. And, and well, he'll explain to us, and we have a great map that shows how far this uh, Assembly District 8 goes, actually. It's really far-reaching, goes way, way up north and into the eastern Sierras. Uh, we also have with us Leon Orndorff uh, back on the show. Good evening, uh, Leon, and, and welcome back Thank to discuss... You some of the state of California issues and legislation, especially as it comes to uh, gun safety, uh, gun control, and all things associated with, you know, how to be a law-abiding citizen in California, you know, carrying guns or being able to purchase guns. So he'll be discussing all of the above. So uh, with that, <clears throat> uh, let's start off by uh, some of the round-robin items. Let's Put it up slide three. Do you support teachers union boss uh, Louis Jamerson becoming Fresno Unified's next superintendent? Sounds like 65% or almost two thirds of the respondents said no. 30% did say yes and 5% no opinion. I think um, Mr. Jamerson, uh, who understands uh, Fresno Teachers Association's issues and Fresno Unified issues, is who's been a union, I guess union boss is a pretty good title. Uh, looking at, he's got lots of uh, experience in negotiating with schools, school districts, representing teachers, teachers' needs, et cetera. And I think he's interested in that <clears throat> position that is just opening up at Fresno Unified because uh, Superintendent Bob Nelson just uh, recently announced his retirement. Uh, let's go to slide five. House Republicans accused of sabotaging policy priorities for political gain. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, a, you know, what, what are the, what are house Republicans doing to sabotage policies of Joe Biden, uh, rejection of bo the border bill, um, also hampers aid to Ukraine <clears throat> and the war with Russia. So I think they want a more strict, uh, border policy. I think president, uh, Trump, uh, said he, he doesn't support, uh, the current policy that's floating through the Senate. So I'm, I'm going to ask uh, David uh, his opinion on the border policy here once we get to him. Slide six. Trump wants to install new RNC leadership, including his daughter-in-law as co-chair. So that's uh, the current chair, uh, Ronna McDaniel, has no immediate plans to step down. Uh, Trump's move reflect uh, his urgency to unite Republicans uh, behind him. Great article on Jimmy Wire from Associated Press. And then, <coughs> excuse me, uh, last item before we get to uh, David Tangipa is, uh, let's put up slide eight, Democrats and Assembly members, no, I'm sorry, Democrat Assembly member, Assembly woman, Esmeralda Soria opposes the new $1.4 billion Fresno State sales tax. She claims uh, nobody approached her to bring dollars in for Fresno State while she's been in the assembly over the last, uh, in the last little over a year. And I think she's helped bring dollars in to some of the other universities and uh, at least colleges in, uh, in California. So... Anyhow, with that, let's uh, roll into uh, David Tangipa. Let's make sure, I, did I pronounce that correctly, David? Tangipa. Tangipa, okay. <laughs> uh, tell, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Yeah, uh, well, first and foremost. Oh. Yeah, and, and why you're doing this. Got it, all right. Well, first and foremost, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, Thank you for allowing me the chance to come and speak to everybody. Again, my name is David Tangipa. I am running for State Assembly District 8. Jim Patterson has termed out, and Jim has endorsed me to replace him. 
Um, and I believe just a little bit about my story. So I'm originally born and raised here in the Central Valley. My mother immigrated here from the island of Tonga. My father's a disabled veteran. We grew up in a community just like Castle Atwater. Um, and back in the 90s, they shut down the military base and uh, we lost about 150,000 jobs. And I remember my father telling me, you know, and he's an old military guy and so he's a little bit tough, um, goes, well, that's what happens when you're not involved in policy. Uh, somebody else is going to make the decisions for you and your community is going to suffer for it. Um, you know, that's just the way that he stated it. And um, so ever since then, I've always been involved, whether it's my local school areas. I mean, I involved and volunteered with other mayor campaigns and different ones that have gone around simply because I knew that policy is what changes people's lives. Um, but I also grew up in a community just like that to where my avenue was through athletics. Um, I had a chance to walk on to Fresno State football. Um, I had the chance, and I quickly realized while I was a walk-on there, I was not an NFL guy. Uh, the NFL guys were 17 and 18-year-olds benching 500 pounds and squatting 700. I wasn't close to that. Uh, so I really doubled down on education because I knew education would be the greatest equalizer. So I got my degrees in political science, criminology, a legal study certificate. I graduated early. Um, I got my master's in business with an emphasis in marketing. I started working in real estate and having my own real estate business um, as well because I saw that that was one of the number one ways to breaking generational poverty was through home ownership. And since then, I've been able to help over 60 of my <clears throat> friends and family, including my parents, myself, focusing on veterans and first-time home buyers, and to do just about $20 million in sales. From that point, I even wanted to be more involved at the local level in working in policy. I started working for Fresno County Supervisor Nathan Magsig as his field representative. I didn't think I was going to get this involved, uh, but it was one week before COVID when I decided to take that job as well. So I got involved with COVID-19. That same year, the Creek Fire happened where over 380,000 acres were burned, 880 structures we had been lost, um, and including those, a lot of my dear friends and family um, that lost a home. And so I've done a lot of work when it comes to, I mean, COVID-19, the Creek Fire, forest management, drought policy, flooding policy. I think California is the only state that has both emergency ordinances going at the same time. Um, and, I, and now I'm running for the state assembly because a lot of the other individuals, whether it's Shannon Grove, Sheriff Mims, Lisa Smithcamp, <clears throat> Nathan Magsig, Jim Patterson, they wanted me to run for this seat because of my dedication to this community. And I look at it like this. If California is the fifth largest economy in the world and yet we have rolling blackouts, that's an accountability issue at the highest level. You know, we, I was recently in Iowa early this month because I was asked to speak to legislators across the nation. And they asked me one question. How bad is California? And I said, well, the food costs here in Iowa are actually cheaper than California, and yet we grow it. It was 19 degrees outside, and the next day it was negative 30. Darius, I know you're a farmer. How much grows in negative 30? So, Almost nothing, yeah. And so and I, I look at all of this, and if we're looking at doing something different for California, if we're looking at Voting for new people. I mean, the definition of insanity, at least to me, is voting for the same people and expecting different results. And so it's, it's here to present something that is taking California, bringing it back from the brink, adding in common sense in a new and modern way. And I look at it from this point. We need to modernize and we need to modernize the messaging. I got my master's in marketing specifically for that so that way we can make change here in California. Physically pull us from the dark because the actual lights get shut off here. And, uh, and I'm here to work with that. And I've passed policies that have implemented my energy and my experience that is needed desperately today. Well, that was a great intro, uh, David, <laughs> really great intro. Uh, but Leon is gonna ask you some questions on uh, gun safety. And we're gonna, then, I'm gonna go to, then I'm gonna go to electricity, electric production, electric vehicles. And, and by the way, uh, we know it's difficult as a Republican to do anything in, in, in the state legislature. So at the end of those or someplace in between those questions, you can weave in, how are you going to get, there's so many things needed for California. Uh, mm -hmm. But our, our le the legislator is, you know, I mean, look at the vehicle mile traveled legislation that's going to make it substantially more difficult to make Highway 99, six lanes all the way through. But I mean, the, the Republicans probably don't have a whole lot of, uh, you know, 
uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, support for for lack of a better word, support and get changing legislation because they're a super minority, right? So be thinking about that because I want to be asking you. But uh, I think Leon, let, let's start off with some uh, gun control uh, thoughts and questions. Leon, hey, how are we doing today, sir? <laughs> I'm doing well. And by the way, let, let, let me introduce or let me introduce Leon. For those of folks that don't know, Leon is an ex-Marine, has served in Afghanistan and Iraq, and is a, a small business owner. He owns a small uh, gun shop. There it is, DACTactical.com, uh, Duck and Cover Tactical, actually. Um, that's that's the website, DACTactical.com is, is his website. And gunsmithing, all things guns, uh, CCW permits, training, etc. So uh, we're on hold for the CCW permit right now. Unfortunately, on hold. Tell us, about, okay, fire so, away. If normally, that's the thing that we're always going to lead with. And instead of going over every single assembly bill, we can just do kind of a round robin or just uh, rapid fire on it. You know, everyone knows about SB two, and that's one that I'm sure you know affected not just uh, a lot of local businesses around the board, from sheriff's department uh, and PD, because. Well, you know, no more of those uh, permits are coming in for applications at this time. We do have about 10 to 12 instructors on that list, so hopefully that boosts up. But same thing, it really puts a stipend on things. Hurts my business, hurts other ranges, other gun shops and everything else. To also include, um, include like your life scan and everything else. So I guess where I'm going to go with this of everything that's out, what kind of are you planning on doing with some of the gun stuff right now it seems like california is just throwing stuff against the wall and it's getting passed and we don't you said you played football there's no we don't have any linebackers we don't have anyone blocking for us at this time yeah, and i love that you say that because that's exactly what as part of my messaging is we need a new game plan and we need an offensive game plan and so when you look at the state of affairs in california oakland is the greatest example that is a proven fact that the government cannot protect you and is not your first line of defense. Your first line of defense for your family, for yourself, for your own self-preservation is you. And that is what the Second Amendment is for. And right now the California legislature is looking at different ways that they can take away and strip your ability to protect yourself, your family, and your livelihoods. It didn't start with SB2. SB2 is actually a response to an original bill where they tried to strip away the sheriff's ability to grant CCWs. And that, I believe, was AB 1133. But then they realized that they could not challenge the sheriff's power to do that. They wanted to centralize everything under the DOJ so that way all of the application and the approval process could be halted simply by not processing the paperwork. That is what they were going to do. Now, SB2 is a response to that is instead of taking away the power from the sheriff of granting the CCWs, now let's make the process almost impossible. And when they passed SB2 in the, at the beginning of this year, we CCW holders were non, they were basically created criminals because of the passing of, the, of SB2. And that was forced legislation. So we just need to realize and call this out. We need to realize and call this out in a new manner. Uh, I've worked with the CRPA, the California Rifle and Pistol Association, to highlight the specific needs needed. The messaging is there. We just need a message properly. And so and that is what I've focused on. And I'm, I am the endorsed candidate by the California Rifle and Pistol Association. I also used to competition shoot, and I joined them for their Taps and Tacos target shooting. Nice. I took third out of 50, and the only two that I lost to were the individual who owned the rifle and the individual who owned the pistol. <laughs> so if, if we're talking about straight shooters that we need, I'm as straight as they come. Awesome. And what's the ability of attacking this? Because another thing we've seen a lot of times with, okay, let's just take what happened with the ammunition, where Judge Benitez overturned something or St. Benitez, depending on how we call him, over to the ammunition <laughs> yeah. thing, we got Freedom Week number two. Yep. All right, that's great. Within five days, this case has been worked on for how long now? Year, two years? Five days, it's overturned and put on a stay. How is that happening, and is there anything that you'd be able to do to stop that? That goes back to that gameplay that we're talking, or that game plan that you're talking about. So you're exactly right. So how is that happening is that we've seen others on the opposite side of the aisle actually strategically place individuals that will move the agenda, whether it's constitutional or not. I mean, that is exactly what it is. And so um, and I can say this, look, if this gets heard in the Supreme Court, we understand where the Supreme Court's going to lay. We've already seen on the uh, uh, Bruin uh, decision. I mean, the, this is the way that we do fight back. 
the Constitution is very, very clear. It's very clear. There's a reason why it is the Second Amendment, because the First Amendment just states all of your God-given rights. The Second Amendment gives you the power to enforce that so nobody else can take it away. And so, and it's where we look at it today. If we can highlight, if I believe as part of the game plan is to show them what happens when we have these soft on crime policies. Look at L.A. County right now. 24 cities are suing L.A. County off of the zero bail policy. Zero bail. They have a site on site release that is coming right now. People do not feel safe. If they do not feel safe and they don't believe that the government can come and protect them, we have an opportunity right now to inform them, to teach them that you can protect yourself better than any other government entity. And I've argued against, I was the chair for the Valley Young Republicans and I was one of the vice chairs for the state. And I specifically said this, how come when somebody shows up with a gun, the first thing that you do is you actually call somebody with a gun to come protect you? <laughs> you right. know what? I, I that gotta, is, ex let, me, let me jump in real quick. Uh, just got a comment from Cam Malloy. She said, every time David speaks, he wins new supporters. Uh, you you obviously you know are very well educated on our <laughs> Second Amendment rights uh, and on uh, uh, and on gun rights uh, for folks. Uh, Leon, um, any one more question? Then I'm going to go to el electrification of cars and what's going to happen to our power <laughs> grid. Um, Absolutely. Uh, tell me your feelings on uh, AB 28, which is 11% tax on firearms that's hap firearms and ammunition that's happening on. Um, on July 1st, and what do you think we should do to overturn that or stop it, or what can we I'll, do? I'll tell you this right now. The first thing that we're working on, especially with the CRPA, is line up the lawsuit. The only issue is you need to have damage before you could sue. So we're, we've actually got everything kind of ready, and I mean, I tell you this, there's even more that I've been working on. Um, so Fresno County is a charter county, and there are different charter amendments that we can work on, and there are different things that we can do to push different amendments and Second Amendment protections. That is something that I am specifically working on to make Fresno County a Second Amendment sanctuary charter county. If they want to play the game, then it's time to play the game. It's time to go back. Absolutely. And if they're, if they're going to push on that, then we, it's a time to add into the Fresno County Charter that we will take a stand. We will take a stand, and it grants us the right to do that, because as a charter county, we have a partnership with the state of California, and California has to respect that partnership. Absolutely, and that's one of those things with a lot of the guns that are coming in right now. We're getting triple taxed on them if that 11% gets hit in. You have state, but also some of the guns coming in, they're getting the California tax. Hey, man, they got to yep. go through a drop list and all that other stuff to be put on the drop roster. So that makes that's really nice to hear that. And again, thank you for hearing my questions. Greatly appreciate it. Um, thank you again, man. Okay. Well, and, and well, I appreciate that. And the last thing that I always say, there's no syntax on defense, and that's what they're trying to do. Yep. You hit the key word too, the syntax. That's what they're calling it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, Leon, Leon, stick around if you if you have a few minutes. Uh, uh, David, let's uh, yeah, let's keep Leon on uh, and, and on the screen. David, tell us about electrification. There's a big push by the uh, Biden administration to make sure X percentage of cars are electric the production of cars are electric you know reduce the you know the gas consumption uh gas powered engine uh, what do we call them internal combustion <laughs> engines ice. internal combustion ice. engines uh, uh limit those uh, and and of course the uh, the growth in electric vehicles is shrinking people go we just can't afford that kind of a money and knowing that our tire replacement is going to be more expensive uh battery replacement if we have to if we keep our car long enough you know, what are we going to do with batteries? Uh, what are the warranty on batteries? I, I can't remember exactly what it is. Call it 10 years. So what's going to happen to those? Uh, and, and then where is the power going to come from? Um, is the electricity supply going to come from? Because it, building new power plants in California is very difficult. Even getting solar plants approved is very difficult with all the envir environmental regulations you've got to go through. So what are your thoughts on on electrification and 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 again think about you know how can you make this thing where it's going to be a pragmatic solution of the legislator right <clears throat> we can think of all the things we want but how do you get something through or at least try to move the needle even if it's one millimeter or a sixteenth of an inch uh, how 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 do you work uh, how, how would you work around that electrification and electric supply yeah 
right. Leon, did you have a question real quick? I saw you. No, please go for it. Uh, okay, well, to... because I'm about because this is one of my favorite topics, so I'm about to start rolling. Oh, yeah, okay. go for it. <laughs> all right, well, so as we all know, and we just look at California today, by 2035, all new vehicles are supposed to be electric vehicles. But yet, I mean, I talked about it here. We're the fifth largest economy, and we already have rolling blackouts. By 2030, 50% of all of the energy produced in California is supposed to be from green and renewable. Well, then let me ask you this question. In 2002, when SB 1078, the California Renewables Portfolio, was passed, they left out large-scale hydroelectrical facilities being considered green and renewable. Well, as chair for the Young Republicans, I actually asked a lot of these environmentalists, and I did a panel with UC Berkeley. And I said, well, can you at least let me know if it is it when it gets to 30 megawatts? Does it start getting less and less green when it hits that 40 megawatt line? And then after 40 megawatts, for some reason, it doesn't get green anymore. So then I look at reviving and working in a pragmatic sense, and I tell them this. So in 2012, Jim, Jim Patterson tried to propose a bill that would have added large-scale hydroelectrical facilities onto the green energies portfolio. Um, but it, it died. It didn't work. Adam Gray picked up that same bill. Adam Gray is a Democrat. It died. Again, it didn't work. Anna Caballero tried to do a one-off shoot for Don Pedro because Don Pedro produces about 74 megawatts. If we can end rolling blackouts today by simply including large-scale hydroelectrical facilities onto the green energies portfolio, the one word that Jim Patterson and I believe Adam Gray left out was the word existing. If on one side, their number one thing is about carbon emissions and different things um, and looking at it from this way, and my side is about ending rolling blackouts, and I call out these California policies of scarcity, then all we need to do is include all existing large-scale hydroelectrical facilities because some of those on the opposite side of the aisle did not want to incentivize dam building. Okay, we won't incentivize dam building. We will actually we will increase the, the supply, lower the demand, end rolling blackouts by just including large-scale hydroelectrical facilities. The Helms Project right here in Fresno County produces over 100 megawatts, over 100 megawatts of power. And it's not considered green or renewable, even though it doesn't produce a single carbon emission and is identified as a net zero carbon em carbon uh, providing facility. And yet it's not included. We have California policies of scarcity and we have individuals who have weaponized the entire process under the guise of compassion. My master's in marketing is to highlight that we are sitting physically in the dark because individuals haven't been able to get this message out. I have stood on this and I will use it every single time because when I have done these debates with individuals across the aisle, I simply ask them, how come, how come 30 megawatts, how come 40 megawatts and everything else isn't included? Because when I grew up and I grew up in low income housing, I grew up very, very poor in a, in a very small house. I know what $20 can do right now and PG&E adding a 33% rate hike is hurting those at the bottom of the totem pole, and it's because of these California policies of scarcity. I won't stand for it because I grew up in that community, because I know what $20 can get me. I know in my 1994 uh, Volkswagen Passat that my father traded a gun for, I know how many miles that I could get per gallon on it because I counted my dollars. I counted every single one of them, and I know what it could do for somebody if we just get out of, the, get out of our own way. California is mismanaged at the highest level. It doesn't make sense to me that Iowa can keep the lights on in a blizzard and we can't even keep the AC on here in the Central Valley. David, oh, was well, that, uh, uh, quick question. Go, what steps quick are you question. Taking? Go, ahead. Oh. go, go, go. Leon, quick question. So, uh, uh, with saying all that, what steps are you taking or what steps will you take to doing all that? Again, remember, Marine here, you got to break it down a little bit on a lower level for me. Oh, yeah. But I think it's so right now we're in the position where there's 18 Republicans and there's eight Senate or there's 18 out of 80 in the assembly and there's eight out of um, 40, 40 in the Senate. So at least this is the silver lining that I can look at is everything that's wrong here in California isn't the Republicans fault because we're a glorified advisory board. So so if I can highlight and point that out that if you're an elected official and you can't keep the lights on, you shouldn't be able to keep your job. My job is to educate individuals. I have actually done that, and I've proven that this has worked before because I worked with Senator Grove on SB 14 to make child sex trafficking a strikeable offense here in California because I have a family member of mine, and she was trafficked at 14 years old by, by a former teammate of mine. And, so, and yet that was arguable today, and the California Public Safety Committee 
actually killed the bill. It did not pass. So what did I do? I highlighted and I exposed these individuals. We activated over 4 million people using different social media tactics, using different PR tactics. And we said, if you don't take a stand on public on child sex trafficking, you took a damn stand. I'm sorry. You took a stand for me. And so we highlighted that 90,000 people wrote to the governor's office. The governor forced it to the floor within 48 hours. It then passed unanimously, 79 to zero because somebody was absent and 40 to zero because all of the senators st stood there. That is doing something different. That is an offensive playbook that we need here in California. I like that. That's good for that, you. That, that's awesome, uh, David. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you will work across the aisle mm -hmm. to get good legislation passed. Of that course. Correct? Yeah. That so is it that, yeah, you, I, you, I, go I, ahead. I, I love talking to the other side. I mean, I've got the so the young democrats a lot of them are actually my friends because one they always ask me this question i find it funny they're like you grew up in low-income housing your mother's an immigrant your father's a hundred percent disabled veteran and you grew up in one of the bluest areas out there how'd you end up as a republican and a conservative i said well i looked at who's in charge here and i blame it on them not on the other people who didn't do anything yeah there also you go like you uh, hold people okay. accountable too yeah, let me, exactly. okay, a couple of questions on, on Facebook Live. Uh, Becky Wharton says, why is PG&E allowed to be such a monopoly? And, uh, I mean, PG&E basically, which is somewhat regulated by CP, California Public Utilities Commission, mm -hmm. which is an, all five members are appointees of the governor, they basically do what, what they want. I mean, is there any oversight uh, that, that the legislator can work with I mean, PG&E's got another rate hike coming, another rate hike coming sometime this summer. What was it, AB? I can't remember what the, the 202 something, 205, where he get charged a surcharge by your um, income. Income over $30,000 a year, uh, you pay a surcharge to, to PG&E. I mean, and they're, I mean they're, they're, they're supposed to be regulated by CPUC, but it sounds like PG&E does what they want. Is that true? Uh, Do you, you so, work? Yeah. I, I do. And so actually, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with this. So what had happened here in California, especially with a lot of the lawsuits that have happened because of the fires, uh, PG&E took on almost all of the liability. Whenever, I believe that some, most of the liability um, here in California is actually on the mismanagement of our forest. I've worked in forest management. And as I talked about the Creek Fire, I worked specifically with Supervisor Nathan Magsig um, to highlight some of these forest management issues because, I mean, Darius, you own a business. You know what happens when litigation comes and they come after you and you've got to spend costs on lawyer and you've got to do all of this. Now they have to protect their assets. And as a, I believe it's called an IOU, an investor-owned utility, um, is what PG&E technically is. And it was, it's, it's an interesting way and it's fairly archaic in my opinion. But as utility companies were putting in infrastructure into some of these areas, they also wanted to own the infrastructure in, in a non-compete uh, contract and so that's kind of why we have all these random ones, whether it's PG&E, SMUD, um, Southern California Edison, that have some of these isolated areas. Um, so I can see at least where it started out that way. But then if you force all of the liability when it comes to the mismanagement of forest onto these utility companies as well, that doesn't make sense. Um, and so I look at as proper forest management as part of the solution to a lot of these rate hikes. We look at the trees and the tree density that we have right now. Uh, UC Berkeley has a study that's called the Blodgett Forest Project that identified that our forest right now has about 800 trees per acre. They also identified that a healthy forest is in between 200, or 20 and 200, depending on the resources available. So if we're at 800 trees per acre, 800 to 1,000, you know, that's like planting 1,000 tomatoes in a one-by-one one box. You'll never have a healthy tree and you'll never have a healthy forest. So if we can look at that, we can at least take the dead trees away we we could promote old growth trees we can protect a lot of these pg e <clears throat> lines we can protect a lot of the infrastructure we can protect the homes we can protect all of the cost that they have to now incur because of these mega fires and we can actually challenge them on some of these other things and then i also look at i mean pg e they are the owners of the big helms project we can lower their costs by simply increasing the supply which lightens the burden on the demand by including that because PG&E in California has these regulations that 50% of their power generation has to come from green and renewable. Well, if 50% has to come from green and renewable and they own all these dams, they can meet that requirement immediately without putting in infrastructure, which are additional costs on a business. 
those are those are really really fascinating points uh, you bring up. Uh, and then a couple other comments on um, Facebook Live. Cam Malloy, this is the type of young new leadership we need statewide and nationwide. <laughs> now that Cam is thinking about what else he should be uh, working on. Also, is there any chance of the income-based part of AB 205 that puts a charge on electric bills statewide being repealed? That is the legislation that was passed by legislators, legislators and then signed into law by the governor. But now there's a lot of Dems that are opposing it because they, they're getting all these uh, complaints from middle-class Californians that go, oh my gosh, I'm going to be paying $40, $50 a month more but not using any more electricity just because of my I'm, I make over thirty thousand dollars a year, so um, PG and E is a joke, <laughs> Robert Wharton. So anyhow, there, it looks like there's movement on the Dem side. So and it sounds like you you said you're going to work across par, uh, aisles uh, across party lines, and if if uh, you get elected, you will work on looking at modifying. AB 205 or amending it or doing something that makes it more balanced so the middle class Californians don't get uh, hurt, basically. Oh, yeah. What, well, 100%. I mean, it does not yeah. make sense that there, it's an income driven charge. That means the more successful that you do, the worse you actually get to benefit. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and it's just highlighting a lot of these middle class individuals. And I tell people this I don't want them to leave. California is worth fighting for. We don't need any more California refugees. We need some California rebels who are actually going to show up and, and fight. I mean, I look at not only the issue when it comes to this income-driven burden that just because you're, you've worked your – and look, I've done it this way where I've worked myself into a position where I was taxed. $40,000 in some of my real estate income, and I had to claim that much even though there could be strategic ways that I could find my way around – I claim that much because I needed to be my mother's sponsor for her American citizenship and take, make it easier. And I just thought to myself, that $40,000 I could have taken, helped my younger brother, helped my sister, and helped anybody else actually purchase a home. But instead, the benefits that we get here in California being the highest tax in the nation, they're not there. They're not there in, in the, the legislature. I mean, if we're looking at it, well, if we're asking for accountability from the individuals who in 2022 and 2023, we had a $98 billion surplus, and now we're at a 30 to maybe 60 to potential $110 billion deficit, I think we're asking the wrong questions. So as my part of my job, it was actually to find individuals, whether the Democrat, Republican, or independent, that just say, I'm tired of California can't. We can't afford it. We can't build. We can't do anything. And let's get out of California can. Let's, act, let's get into California can and actually highlight some of these issues that we have created for ourselves. These are policies of scarcity. That means it's a people issue, not a California issue. Great points. Um, we're just about wrapped up with, uh, with this segment, but uh, I want to talk about taxes and a local tax measure. But we have a, uh, there was an event that occurred, I think it's yesterday, a press release yesterday. Uh, Assemblywoman uh, Esmeralda Soria was there, a couple of other local uh, elected. I think Miguel, Council Member Miguel Arias was there as well. I think we have a video. Let's play that, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Quick and brief question. Okay. Okay. I am proud to be standing here with a bipartisan group of community leaders who oppose the $1 billion sales tax increase, Measure E. Fresno State is just that. It's a state university. It's owned by the state of California. And the, the people of Fresno County should not be burdened with a tax increase to pay for improvements that the state should be doing of its own. Assemblyman Jim Patterson, who served our area for 12 years and now is finishing, has never entered a bill, not one time in 12 years. Has he ever entered a bill or anything else that could help Fresno State? Where the hell you been, Jim? I think Measure E would have obtained the support of the general public if it didn't have an oversight committee of insider cronies that were going to be paid $14 million to dole out billions of dollars of taxes. What could we do with that $14 million but instead pay seven people? I don't recall any oversight board of any local measure that pays any of the oversight committee. So we need to be wary. Um, this seems so wrong to me and a waste of our taxpayer money. 
There's plenty of opportunities for voluntary funding of Fresno State. They bring in lots of money through other voluntary contributions, and as a libertarian, that's the way I would prefer that Fresno State would get funded. But it is a state school, not a Fresno County school, and it should not be funded by aggressive sales tax. Regressive sales tax means that the poorest pay as much or more as the wealthiest in the county. People who benefit from the, from the university donate to it. Why are the Carr brothers? Why haven't they given a dime to fix a stadium? Where are all the you know, NBA uh, superstars that we've generated locally that have benefited? Instead, they're asking my mom, a retired farm worker who's paying for coffee at Walmart, to pay more so that the next David Carr can come out of the stadium. I would issue a grade F to the administration uh, for transparency. Um, lack of transparency to engage the public, lack of transparency to bring all stakeholders to the table to have these really important conversations, but most importantly, an F grade for the financial burden that they're going to place upon low-income voters in Fresno County. Actually, I hadn't seen uh, um, that video until now. As, a, as a, <laughs> what, what, are, what are your thoughts in general about Fresno State funding? And that, that's probably my last question for you. Uh, what, 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 how do we, you know, I mean, Fresno State has got a lot of dilapidated facilities, uh, has got, you know, a lot of um, programs that need help. There's some conversation uh, amongst folks that says, hey, we need a statewide tax to fund all Cal State universities, or the, 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 le the legislator needs to look at the annual budget, which is over $300 billion, which after in inflation adjusted is about, what is that, 65% uh, more than when it was in 2010, even though the pop population of the state is the same. So what are the, what is the state doing with the money? Some, some transparency, some kind of an audit. Uh, so uh, what, I think what an audit is specifically yeah. needed. Okay. Yeah. And so, so what, and, and, and I, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. What are your thoughts on how, how do we deal with Fresno State? Their, their issues. <laughs> I think, well, I, I think there's a lot there. And I think it's especially, I mean, we're calling out the state. I mean, this is calling out the state when it looks at as um, from the accountability sense. I mean, again, you look at a $98 billion surplus and we couldn't get funding for ADA requirements. That's one of my biggest things that I'm worried about. I know that there's a lawsuit right now in Kings County and uh, Tulare County <laughs> that is actually going around and they're suing K through 12s for not being ADA compliant. I can tell you this, that group's probably not gonna stop at just K through 12 and they're gonna start targeting other areas and dilapidated buildings that, you know, and I, I, I've always heard this position and not only that, when it comes to, to me, you know, Fresno State changed my life and I also know what a education again here has made me a business owner, somebody who can sponsor their mother's immigration, change the lives of my own family where we were able to take care of our own community through the education I got. So I'm looking at, I mean, I'm running to bring, I, I, we heard Brooke Ashton right there and Brooke Ashton is the uh, uh, chair for the Lincoln Club. The Lincoln Club has also endorsed me even though they, they are against Measure E. And I look at bringing that accountability back to Sacramento and highlighting it. If we're at a $98 billion surplus, I'll tell, I'll, well, I'll tell you this, I will present that bill. Um, to ask for funding because Fresno State is one of the diamonds of the valley when we look at the value that it brings, the individuals that are here. I am here because of it. I have created these connections, whether it's Supervisor Magsig and everybody else because of it. And I just look at it. If a lawsuit comes and they sue off of ADA compliance, just one example, and just because I lived my life there and I practiced there for five years, I just ask people this, where's the elevator in Bulldog Stadium? You know, and if there's an emergency or if there's potentially a shooting right there off the of sixth street uh, in the area and the stadium needs to be evacuated and people are being evacuated a little bit older and they get bumped and they fall and they break their hip and they pass away or something like that. That is a hundred million dollar lawsuit that will settle for 15. That is a big worry of mine. Let me let me ask this question, David. You know, would you if you get elected, would you ask the governor or the legislator to fund, to come up with additional funding to repair 
you know, just like what Esmeralda, Assemblywoman Saria said, Esmeralda Saria, there's funding available. If surplus years, it becomes really easy. In, in uh, you know, in years where you have a deficit, it becomes more, more complicated. But, you know, we pay property tax and sales tax that goes into education, education funding. Would you work aggressively with the state legislator and the governor and say, okay, we need to fund not only Fresno State, but all Cal State systems that are have dilapidated uh, buildings and infrastructure and Let's, less reliance on local dollars and more reliance on the statewide dollars. So, I, so it's one of the things that I've learned um, from my position. I think I can speak their language very well and I can tell them, I'm, I, I, and I'm gonna say this to them too. Fresno State is a minority majority CSU system. It's in one of the most impoverished areas and one of the most dilapidated areas. And we need you to step in there um, it, or call them out for not caring about the community because that's exactly what they've done uh, in a lot of other areas. The rural representation that we have had here, um, we've kind of tried the same thing, but I speak their language that they can hear it in a Republican and a conservative manner because that's the language that's needed. I can't go in there and speak in Mandarin when they're, they're speaking Cantonese. I, I need to go and I need to speak their language so that they can hear exactly what's going on. It's the same thing that I've talked about when it comes to carbon emissions, whether it's forest management, it's the same thing that I've talked about when it comes to utility, it's the same thing when it comes to talk about accountability and fiscal spending. As a business owner and a successful business owner, I do believe I have the experience <clears throat> to do so and also the means to call them out when we don't get our just desserts. Great. Right. Uh, uh, before, I think Leon has a question for you, but I want to ask you, so is Tonga in Tan Tanzania? No, no, no. Tonga is like Samoan and Hawaiian. Oh, okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So All that's right. why, that, that's the Polynesian in me. Got it. Okay. Uh, Leon, yeah, do you have any more questions for uh, candidate for state assembly, David Tangapa? Not really a question, just mainly a question for the show. And like I said, I like breaking things down shotgun style. And obviously, I understand there's a tax <laughs> for, uh, for the uh, college that we have going. But let's break this down a little bit. Where does a college get its funding? And not only that, where does tuition go? Where do all those things go? Because kind of like a college, it is a business in a sense. Yes, it's education. But if it's not functioning or it's unable to, uh, to fund itself or sustain itself, what... Where's everything going? Because obviously it costs a lot of money to go to college. And we've asked you a lot of tough questions. I know you're not in the legislature yet, yeah. but you're supposed to know all these answers. <laughs> questions to all, <laughs> questions well, was, to all these. A general question for both of y'all, to be honest with you. There like you go. Said, but no. In style. It's, uh, it, it's maybe, do you want to take a stab at that, David? Well, I can tell you, I, I do know that the state actually has a 5% mandatory funding for some of these state colleges that are allocated fairly evenly um, amongst them. I don't know where all of the funding goes, whether it's salaries or different things. Um, but I mean, working with, I've worked with the Bulldog Foundation because I'm as Fresno State Bulldog born, Bulldog bred, going to be a Bulldog to the day I'm dead. Um, I also know that these scholarships changed my life. Um, and so, and I actually in 2017, 2016, in 2016, I ended up homeless at Fresno State. Um, and a scholarship changed my life where I was able to graduate from all of this. So I do know when people donate to Fresno State, it actually goes back to the athletic fund. Um, and that's just on the athletic side. That, that I don't believe is school-wide, but I can tell you this, when I get into the assembly, it's audit time and we're gonna take it to them and we're gonna find the money because that's what most people want. I actually have a policy video coming out $98 billion surplus to a $68 billion deficit. That's $150 billion swing. Where's the money? So now it's time to find it. Awesome. I love that answer. Um, again, let me let me see if there's any other questions. Uh, oh, uh, Robert Wharton, how big is Fresno State's endowment? I think his point is the endowments and donations, uh, charitable, uh, well, donations to Fresno State should be used for a lot of these facilities upgrades like most colleges across the country are. I don't know what the size of the endowment, but I, I, I want to say it's in the couple hundred million dollar range. Uh, Inga, Inga Schlegel, yes, audits. Uh, yes on audits. Show us the numbers. <laughs> Show gonna, us the numbers. So hopefully, Show us the money. If you get in the legislator and they, you say you ask for an audit and they, can they say no? I don't know if the, does the audit, you have to be in the audit committee, I'm assuming. And then if the, if you're not in the audit committee, 
he can, I guess, but but you but I liked what you heard, but but you said earlier, if you can't get your way on something that benefits the whole state, you're gonna go raise the raise the bar, educate folks, and send have folks send thousands and th tens of thousands of emails to the legislator and the governor. Yep, that is the one way that they hear us. And look, if they don't want to audit it, then fine. I'm going to file a public records request. I'm going to raise the money, and we're going to hire independent auditors to come in and expose that. And I'm going to be there every step of the way to take, find, and pull these files out. And I can tell you this. I know a question was earlier asking whether I wanted to run for all of these other things. I don't. Um, I actually want to stay in California. California has more than enough issues. I'm here to fight. My family needs me to fight here. Washington isn't creating these issues. California is. And, and it's those individuals that I'm, I'm committed to staying here. I am committed to just Assembly District 8. I am committed to California because in 20 years, I want to be a high school football coach. I want to do the radio for Fresno State. And I want to hang out with my family and drink some beer. That's what I want to do in 20 years. And, and I just don't see that future happening right now. And it's why I'm getting involved today. Awesome, David. I have a another question for you. Do you are you a, a familiar with Michael Marr? Uh, who's I am running familiar for, with Mike. He has uh, he has a program that he's been on the show, and we're going to get him on the show here in the next few weeks. Uh, he has a program on how to actually use hydrogen technology mm -hmm. to number one for uh, semi trucks, uh, so you don't have to have refueling stations uh, or what do you call it? Uh, yeah, refueling stations for ele for electric. Uh, rechar recharging stations, I should say, uh, a, uh, you know, a, a capsule that basically goes into your, into your, uh, somewhere on your truck engine bay, uh, and and he's working on several projects that that are carbon negative, hydrogen producing carbon negative. Uh, any thoughts on Michael Michael Moore? I mean, he's running for uh, U.S. Congress, I think, uh, in in the whatever the district is against, against uh, Jim Costa. Twenty one. Yeah, I believe that's District 21. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that. Uh, I know Mike, Mike had stated that he's got the nuclear experience, so I'm going to leave that to the nuclear guy. The only thing I know about hydrogen is that the byproduct is actually water. So, um, you know, if that's what makes yeah. sense, I could just tell you this. I don't know where hydrogen at, is at on the green energies renewables portfolio, but I, I'll make sure that they actually consider that one green. There, there uh, probably is going to be known as uh, you know, uh, carbon positive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's carbon negative. Inga says, please audit high speed rail. How many billions Ooh. are we spending? And we have no results after a decade, basically. It, but that, I could tell you this, that is going to be one of my number one things. I am actually working on something right now that is very, very interesting when it comes to high-speed rail. Um, and it's just what people look at. I think people are really looking at for accountability here in California. I studied abroad in Australia, and I got an international business uh, certificate doing that. And Australia, which is the 11th largest economy in the world, has better public transportation than California. That doesn't make sense. And this was something that was voted on by the voters. The voters should not have to wait. I mean, I would say 10 years, but really it's going to be a whole lot longer than that um, for the things that they had specifically asked for. And people are tired of it. I can guarantee you this. I'm looking for the money. I'm going to find it. And I will use different avenues so that the voters know exactly what is going on. So that way we can bring back accountability to California. Okay, uh, one last comment on Facebook, and then I want to see if Leon has any final questions, and then uh, David, you will get the last word on closing statements. Cam Lewis, All right. she says, "I'm a bulldog born and bulldog bred too," and I think we have a great new president, uh, Dr. Uh, Saul Jimenez Sandoval, and I don't uh, think you have any problems with audits or transparency of spending of the funding. I also think if Measure E pa is passed, he will implement it very well. Okay. Uh, so with that, Leon, any uh, final questions? No, I'm good, man. Thank okay. you for having me on. Okay. Impressive. <laughs> okay. Uh, David, it, it was really a pleasure uh, having you on the show and hearing your insights and your depth of knowledge on so many issues. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, I got to tell you, it's, it's exceptionally impressive. Uh, to know so many things, you're not even in the assembly, but you've done so much research and you've already done so much, such a, so, so much groundwork uh, on educating yourself and also how to get people's attentions in the assembly. I love that. I love that. I mean, two mothers, was it one or two mothers 
1980, one of them, uh, their daughter got killed by a drunk. And our law, they they went about changing the laws of the country, right? Uh, the 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 drinking. That was that was mad. Mad mothers, mother, exactly, mothers right. against drunk drivers, yep. exactly. Yep. Uh, so. Wow. Inga said, David, you have my vote. Cam Malloy said, uh, David, you have my vote. So there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, any anyhow, so that, that's very impressive. Final thoughts uh, on you to the GV Wire unfiltered audience. Uh, the number one thing is I just look at I'm a tried and true Californian, and I love this state. I love this state, and and I love the people here. I love the people here because my life has changed uh, because of them. You know, I've I've looked at it from my own business standpoint that I could go off and I could be happy and all of this, but this community wrapped its arms around me, and now it's my turn to go back and work for them. Um, <laughs> and and I really look at this. It's time that we try something different for California because I'm tired of the abuse, and I don't want any more California refugees. When I say I want some California rebels. I want to stand up and I want to fight for the members here in the Central Valley that have done something different when it comes to taking care of people. I look at some of these farmers. The farmers do the greatest good, and yet they're demonized for it. I asked a question previously before. How come Google gets, ten, gets the key to the city when they plant 10 trees and add drip irrigation, and farmers plant a million trees and invent a drip irrigation, and they get demonized for it? We can get out of our own way here in California if we want it. California voters are getting everything that California voted for, but that's because I believe that they've been lied to under the guise of compassion. I'm going to expose that. I'm going to be here. I want to be in every single community, and I want to take care of them just like they took care of me. So vote for David Tangipa uh, by March 5th. You can find my website. I always have to remember to do that part. No, but, we uh, have it. We ha it's on the screen. Don't worry about <laughs> it. All right. <laughs> David Tangipa but, for assembly.com. Now, how did you come up with such an abbreviated website name? Web name. Uh, well, it's because I left out my middle name, which is Jerry Stokai Utolele. So <laughs> if anybody's wondering what the J stands for, that is my middle name. My middle name is Jerry Stokai Utolele. Okay. That's that's very cool. Let's put up, uh, okay, David, uh, your endorsement, say that again. Uh, your, so uh, got, who, who are you endorsed by? Back by. So, so I've got Jim Patterson, Margaret Mims, Lisa Smith Camp, Nathan Magsig, the other members on the board of supervisors. I've got uh, Jerry Dyer. I've got everybody. I've got nine other assembly members. I've got three other senators. I have individuals. That, I have different governors in other states for some reason supporting me just because they see how vital that California is. And they also okay. see just how much we want to do. So here locally, I've got Jim, Lisa, uh, Sheriff Mims, Sheriff Zanoni, Nathan Magsig. And everybody else, but the only endorsement that I need is the Fresno County, Madera County, Mariposa, Tuolumne, Calaveras, Mono, Inyo. Um, and I think I got them all. So well, no, that's gonna, those, it's that endorsement I need. We, we're gonna put we're gonna put the map of the district actually uh, on the screen. It should be coming up any second now. Uh, slide eleven. Here we go. There's the map. I don't know if you can see it or not, David. That, that's a large. Territory. I know it's not super populated, but it's a large territory. It, it is the second largest in California, and I believe I'm the only candidate with the energy and the experience to take it. And it's going to take me six and a half hours to get the Bishop Independence Mammoth, but I'll be there. That's awesome. Okay. On behalf of all of us at the uh, GV Wire Unfiltered, thank you, David, for uh, coming on the show. Leon, thank you for uh, giving insights into Second Amendment rights. Uh, that we enjoy in, in our country and some of the restrictions uh, California's uh, residents and citizens uh, uh, have uh, go, go through. Um, it's really, really insightful listening to you, David. Thank you for being on the show. Leon, thank you. Thank you, sir. And, and hope to see, I know Leon is going to be coming back uh, soon because uh, there's so many things happening with guns and ammo and restrictions and gun training and gun safety laws in California, and it sounds like you're going to be coming back. Oh, one last question. In March 5th, which is the election, is it the top two vote getters go to the November, even if somebody gets 99, over 50 percent of the vote? Is that correct? That's like, I yes. feel like the federal. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so all state elections um, will be a jungle primary. That means regardless of party, uh, the top two will move on. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Thank you again. And uh, hope to see you in the neighborhood soon. Thank you, David. All right. I'll be there Thank soon. You, Leon. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.
Bye. Take care.